Uh, our next speaker is Dr. David Ladder. And in the ongoing game between Toronto and Montreal, Dr. Ladder is a home run for Toronto. He uh, graduated from McGill University in 1982 and completed residencies in general surgery and CVT at McGill and a clinical fellowship in thoracic transplantation at Stanford. Um, he was on staff at the uh, Royal Victoria Hospital in Montreal from 1991 to 1996. And in 1996, he was appointed to a position at the University of Toronto's St. Michael's Hospital Division of Cardiac Surgery. He has been a professor in the Department of Surgery since 2015. So during his many years at the University of Toronto, Dr. Ladder has held various positions. I'm just going to pick out a couple of them. Chair of the Royal College Examination Board, Program Director of Cardiac Surgery, Acting Chair of the Department of Surgery. He's currently the director, the, the director of MD Admissions and Student Finances at the University of Toronto. Dr. Ladder specializes in adult cardiac surgery with a special interest in mitral valve surgery. And the title of his presentation is Surgical Decision-Making During Tricuspid Valve Surgery. David? Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, who's going to advance my slides for me? Will that, will that be you, Fatima? Uh, David, you can go ahead and share your screen, and that should give you control to advance your slides as well. Perfect. Okay. I'm just gonna... So I'm just going to share my screen, right? And I'll just give this talk here. Okay. Sorry, excuse me for the delay. So thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be uh, talking to this group and it's a wonderful uh, meeting organized by the, uh, my, my colleagues across the city. Uh, very appreciative to be here. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest. And uh, these are the objectives for this 20 minute talk. Uh, hopefully we'll be on time. And uh, we're going to just review some of the some of the you know the issues of, regarding decision making in the operating room about, about uh, tricuspid valve surgery, uh, the indications, and of course some of the techniques that we use. So I'm just going to minimize this. This is just uh, something I think you all are aware of in the AHA guidelines of 2020, talking about the severity of TR. And we've cha changed the name over the years. Uh, we now call them stages, and C and D are uh, severe TR. The difference, of course, is the presence of symptoms or not. So C is severe without symptoms, and D is. Um, and that's primarily where we do most of our interventions on tricuspid valve is when they're severe, except, except sometimes when we're doing left side, left side of the heart surgery, we may, we may intervene on a, a patient with only a stage B uh, severity of, of TR, or what we used to call moderate MR. This is the uh, current um, guidelines, HA guidelines. And I just put this up here as the start of this talk to, to point out that really there's only one class, one indication, and that is to address severe TR. Uh, when we are in the operating room uh, doing something on the left side, usually the mitral valve, but it can occasionally be on the aortic valve or even bypass surgery. Uh, but that's a 1A indication. The other indication um, that, uh, uh, that we do um, in the operating room is really uh, this one here, um, who, who have stage, uh, stage B, uh, but they have a dilated annulus. And some of my previous uh, speakers, some of the previous speakers have talked about that, and I'll address that a little bit more about where that came from. So you may only have moderate TR or what we call stage B now, but if you have a dilated annulus, you probably ought to be uh, taking care of that in the operating room when you're doing left-sided surgery. Uh, but it's a 2A uh, indication. The other ones that are in this list um, are functional TR, and of course, there's a couple here that are talking about primary TR, such as this one here. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later as well. So functional TR, or what people used to call secondary TR. Uh, my previous speakers have talked about this. There's lots of different causes. Uh, the most common cause, of course, is left-sided cardiac disease, um, valve disease, or, or, or LV function. Um, you can have pulmonary hypertension. What about right ventricular enlargement? That's sort of the primary etiology that does happen. I've operated on some of those patients. Um, there's different reasons why that may occur. And this, this one here that I've listed, longstanding atrial fibrillation and annular dilatation, 
I didn't think that that was a real thing, but it, it definitely is. And there are a cohort of patients who have long-standing atrial fibrillation and for reasons I don't really understand, just seem to dilate their, their tricuspid valve annulus and develop TR dialysis as well. Organic or primary TR, uh, these, are, these are some of the causes, there are others. Endocarditis is probably the most common one. Trauma is not rare, pacemaker is not rare. Um, but uh, if uh, we have different, um, we have, I think, a different uh, uh, indication for surgery when it's a primary valvular disease versus uh, a secondary or functional TR. So I'm just going to talk about uh, some of the studies that have, uh, I think are relevant for this discussion. Uh, this was a, a study in the JTCVS out of the Mayo Clinic where they looked at their, um, the incidence of TR in their patient cohort depending on what was the, um, they all had, uh, they all had uh, surgery on the left side, usually the mitral valve. And they noted that the, the occurrence of TR occurring post-op mitral valve repair uh, was not that great if the, if the mitral valve indication was for um, prolapse or a, a typical mitral valve um, you know, a mitral valve uh, MR case where we were doing leaflet, uh, mitral valve leaflet and annuloplasty. If it was for a rheumatic mitral valve surgery, the incidence of uh, progression of the TR post-op seemed to be greater and, and significantly greater. And, and then in the final um, sort of group of patients that they looked at, uh, if, if, the inter if the intervention in the mitral valve was due to ischemic myocardial disease, the progression of TR post-op was, was the worst. So these things are something that we have to bear in mind when we are faced with decisions to whether or not to intervene in the tricuspid valve when we're operating on the mitral system, mitral valve. This is a study that came out of uh, Harefield but Dr. Dreyfus, he now works in, he's a cardiac surgeon who works in Monaco. It was a pretty important paper. And it was um, a group of patients, they took about, I think it was about 300 patients. And they decided that they couldn't rely on preoperative echo assessment to really give them information about, should something be done about the tricuspid valve when we're doing mitral valve repair surgery? So they made a decision to just, and every one of their patients, they opened the right atrium, and did an actual uh, measurement of the, of the tricuspid valve. And they took a measuring tape, a little you know, sterile measuring tape. They put it at the commissure between the anterior and septal commissure. And they stretched out the, they stretched out the mitral valve, the tricuspid valve, so that it was sort of you know, linear, and just measured the distance from here to as far as they could stretch it out. And they found, and if, if it was greater than seven centimeters, so this was when they talked about seven centimeters, they're not talking about a diameter, they're really talking about stretched out length. Uh, they would then intervene on the tricuspid valve with typically an annuloplasty, and, and that was probably the predominant uh, intervention, maybe some, some small minor leaflet work or um, you know, uh, exclusion of some uh, enlarged commissures. But they did routinely did that, and they the group that had seventy millimeters or more they intervened, and the ones that were less they left alone. Uh, they use they use they use almost exclusively size thirty two or thirty four thirty two in women and size thirty four rings in men, and they looked at the outcomes, and it was really interesting that there's there was clear clear benefit for the group that had something done to the tricuspid valve. They had less TR and less CHF. But, uh, and this is probably true, I think, in all surgical series, uh, the survival wasn't improved. There was still the same survival, uh, but they did have less heart failure, less uh, TR. And this is, I think, one challenge that we may see in this sort of new era of uh, percutaneous intervention, that yes, we can do these procedures and take away the TR, but does it make people live longer? And that is a big question. So uh, currently, uh, and I just did a little survey when I was preparing this talk, uh, different centers, there's still quite, a, a, who have reported on this, quite a variation in, in how, what percentage of patients who are undergoing mitral valve surgery have their tricuspid valve operated on at the same time. The Mayo Clinic and Toronto General, it's like less than 10%. Uh, Mount Sinai in New York, this is David Adams' group, uh, it's as high as 65%. Um, and other centers, Pennsylvania is very high, uh, Harefield 
uh, takes an aggressive approach and they're sort of intermediate. But that's quite a large variation between, you know, pre prominent centers with, that are doing as low as 10% or as high as 65% intervention rates on the tricuspid valve. So when we decide what we're gonna do, uh, if we do anything on the tricuspid valve, it's really important for us to consider the anatomy. And that's why I really appreciated Dr. Vegas' talk uh, and, and Dr. Onran, where they really talked about the anatomy to help the surgeons make decisions. And these are, of course, are the important things. The annular dimension, um, we currently use at St. Michael's, and I think most people use pre-op echo, uh, measuring 40 millimeters in the, uh, the dimension between the middle of the septal leaflet to the middle of the anterior leaflet in diastole, uh, preferably in the four chamber view. Uh, perhaps it's more accurate if you used an indexed uh, version of that, because some people are bigger or smaller, um, but this is a pretty useful number, 40. Uh, the RV size is important. Um, I don't know any really good measurements or I, of, of that or, or, or even uh, also important is the RV function. Hard to measure that uh, and get a, uh, you know, something that we can uh, hang, uh, make decisions based on that uh, with. Leaflet tethering, commissure, and scallop depth. So I'm going to show you a picture where the tricuspid valve is very variable in its anatomy, and some of them have really deep scallops in the anterior leaflet. It looks, it looks like it's a fourth leaflet. Uh, the severity of TR, of course, if it's three plus or more, then I think we ought to do something. If it's two plus, then we can make some decisions. Um, and of course, the severity of the TR fluctuates. Uh, and it fluctuates pre-op. If you happen to do the echo on the patient a, a day when they're um, when they're well diuresed, uh, you may have much less TR than a week later when they've, you know, they've, um, they've consumed too much fluid, uh, they've stopped taking their Lasix or whatever is going on. And uh, we certainly see that in the operating room where intraoperative assessments of TR are always less than the preoperative assessments. So um, one of the issues about leaving the tricuspid valve, of course, and this is what, we, what we're really talking about here, what is the consequences of that? Um, I don't think there's much difficult, there's certainly no change in mortality in the short term. And I think I would, I'm hard pressed to find any papers that show a long-term difference of whether the tricuspid valve is intervened on at the time of mitral valve surgery that affects survival. But we do know the TR gets worse over time and severe, severe TR definitely gets worse. And we do know that dilated tricuspid valve analysis uh, lead to TR, and that gets worse over time. And these factors, female, atrial fib, diabetes, they seem to um, promote uh, progression of TR. And um, again, I talked about the, the mixed um, you know, rates of intervention. Uh, and of course, the real problem is, is this last comment here, is that if you don't do something at the time of the first surgery, and then five years later, the patient has, has severe TR and is really struggling. The operative mortality risk is, is at probably at least 10% on those patients. And so that is a, a significant risk to the patient uh, to start to consider surgical intervention at that time. Um, that, a paper from the Mount Sinai that said, uh, they indicated that 65% of their patients that they were operating on, on the mitral valve were having something done to the tricuspid valve was actually presented at the AATS meeting in 2015, and it actually uh, was quite controversial, led to a lot of sort of um, discussion at the time, and Tyrone David got up and said that that's crazy, you're over-treating. Anyway, so this fellow, Robert Dion, who's a well-known cardiac surgeon who works in Belgium now, wrote an editorial in the JTCVS, and he basically summarized, I think, the current thinking um, and um, gave some recommendations, which I listed here. So. If the TR is greater than or equal to plus, you should do an annual plasty at time of mitral valve surgery. If it's greater than two plus and tenting, you should do an annual plasty and leaflet augmentation, which I'll show you in a minute, uh, sort of pictures of that. Uh, what if the TR is less than two? So you're talking about, you know, he's talking about um, moderate TR um, and, or mild, and but they have an annulus that's greater than 40 millimeters, he recommends doing an annual plasty. Um, and he even goes so far that if it's if your TR is, you know, like one plus, and but your annulus is between three point thirty five and forty, uh, maybe if you have these other risk factors, you should consider surgery as well. This is what I do now. I think it's a reasonable approach. Um, 
similar to what the previous slide just showed. Severe TR, you have to intervene. Moderate TR, but annular dilatation, you, are, you, ha you have to intervene. Uh, we know TR progresses. Um, the incidence of significant TR after MVR if it's left untreated is at least 25% in the five to 10 year range. The, more, the mortality of an isolated tricuspid valve replacement or repair surgery is high, especially for redo surgery. And um, the, the, there is, even though there may not be a survival benefit, there is a significant impact on the patient's quality of life in terms of heart failure. Uh, uh, heart failure. So this is the current 2020 guidelines from AHA. And I just want to put this up here to point out that the only class one indication is this one, which is at the time of left side of surgery, if you have severe TR, you have to do something. The other one that I think is pretty straightforward, again, at the time of, of left side of heart surgery is this other column here, which is only stage B or moderate TR, but with annular dilatation, that's a 2A indication. So these two, I don't think there's too much controversy about. The ones that, and then these two, the one the second from the left and the second from the right, these are primary tricuspid valve problems. So they have a ruptured cord or a, 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 a endocarditis and they have a hole in the, in, the, in, the, in the leaflet. And I think we really ought to be repairing those, especially if you're having light heart failure and you have primary TR, you should have surgery. Uh, this one, what about this one? These are asymptomatic patients. Um, they have severe TR, but they're asymptomatic. Uh, and I think you probably should intervene on these patients before uh, this progresses to uh, severe in severity, uh, or especially with symptoms, but it's only a 2B recommendation. And then this was the one that's probably the biggest category of them all, which are patients that have functional TR, secondary TR, uh, and they have right heart failure, they're sick, and what do we do with them? So if you don't have, if you don't have uh, pulmonary hypertension, then yes, surgery seems indicated. Uh, annular dilatation is, is easy to fix with an annuloplasty. Other things like tethering is, uh, or RV dysfunction are much harder to fix. In fact, cannot be fixed RV dysfunction with surgery. And the reason why this third column over here is a 2B is because this is their, their re-ops. They've had previous surgery and the risk of surgery is higher. So the indication seems to be a little less uh, strong. Um, I'll just pass over that. Again, uh, this is for organic TR, which we do operate on, especially if they're having, if it's severe and they're having, and they're symptomatic. These are the different techniques we can use. And I'm gonna show you some diagrams or pictures of these. Um, but basically the answer is, you know, you fix, you fix what's broken. <laughs> so this is the anatomy of the tricuspid valve. This is a typical surgeon's view. I wish it actually looked like this when we opened the right atrium in the operating room. It's all nicely labeled. Um, uh, this is the, uh, the coronary ostium. So this is a useful landmark for us because we know somewhere around the middle of the septal leaflet to the, to the commissure is the conduction system, which we want to avoid. So we don't ever want to really be putting stitches in here. This is the triangle of, uh, of Koch. Kosh, and it, 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 there's a tendon here called the tendon of Tadaro, which we can easily see. And that triangle, we don't want, really want to be putting stitches in. So that's why annual plastic stitches will start about here and go around. Uh, this looks very nice, three leaflets, easily identified, no deep clefts. It really, really rarely looks this, this neat, but that is the sort of the anatomy of the tricuspid valve. This is what uh, annual plastic looks like. This is, uh, some people recommend putting a pledging stitch here. This is sort of in the orifice of the coronary sinus. It does a lot to coronary sinus, but that's where it's tethered where, or, or based out of, and we're, we're avoiding this area because that's where the conduction system is. And that gives a nice closure. This is one that looks in the operating room. Um, this is an older style tricuspid ring, Carpaccio Edwards ring. The, the newer ones are a little bit shorter here. Again, you sort of, you can see one, two, three, four leaflets and you say, well, what's what? Well, you know, sometimes it looks like that. It, it's not, doesn't look like this very often. It, it can be quite variable in its appearance. Um, bicuspidization. So if you have a prolapsing posterior leaflet, this is septum, this is posterior, this is anterior. Uh, this used to be a technique that was done quite frequently. We would just take it out of the circuit, you know, um, Plicated out, um, and some surgeons in the in, you know early days just left it, but most people would put a ring on here now to reinforce that. 
Um, someone talked, uh, Dr. Vegas talked about leaflet tethering. This is a very real phenomena it's when the RV dilates and everything moves away from the trichothanglus. So we would have to put a ring on there to reduce the size of the annulus. But to deal with the tethering, it's been suggested that um, pericardial patches put in. So you take a piece of the, of the patient's pericardium and just stitch it in to elongate the anterior leaflet and, and make it, uh, and close the common, close the clefts and make it uh, competent. Uh, this is a, something called the clover technique. So uh, again, it would be with an annual plasty. This is really useful for people with prolapsing leaflets. So that's more of a primary cause of TR. And you just, it's like an Alfieri stitch. Of course, it looks similar to the, uh, what would uh, be done with clips, but with a stitch. Uh, pacemaker reduced, we do these kind of repairs. We would move them out of the anterior leaflet. If it was stuck there, we close it and put it over to the side in the commissure area. And this is, um, this is hard to do. These are putting in uh, artificial cords. Because the right ventricle is so large and so uh, dependent on size, it's really hard to get these the right length. So they're, they're kind of hard to do. They can be done if you have to, uh, but it's difficult to get them right. I'm just gonna show you a couple of pictures uh, at the end of my talk. Uh, this was a case that we did uh, about a year ago. Um, we have a very active uh, group of cardiologists that put all sorts of devices in, and this is an evoke valve that went in that unfortunately had to come out because it embolized. It's a little video of the technique. It looks enormous, it looks like a UFO. Uh, it looks enormous because it is enormous. It's like 45 millimeters in, in diameter. Well, that's a big, that's a big, a hard one to try to the And then this is a case, my last couple slides, is a, is a young fellow who was a stuntman who uh, fell, uh, falling out of a window, I think on a movie set, landed on his chest, suffered a pretty significant uh, right ventricular myocardial contusion, was in hospital for a week or two, um, you know, initially had some arrhythmia as they settled down, had no rupture to his tricuspid valve, but over the year he developed severe TR. And uh, I was, uh, I ended up operating this fellow and his, because of his contusion from his right ventricle, his right ventricle got, got larger and everything was pulled apart and dilated. And this is, his anterior leaflet actually with a deep cleft that normally is not a problem with a normal sized uh, right heart, but in this patient was being held open and he had severe TR through that area. And here's his posterior leaflet and the septerior leaflet. And you can see almost there's like a gap between the, septer, sept, the septal leaflet and the posterior leaflet where it just can't close. So I addressed those things, I sewed this up uh, the, the cleft the anterior leaflet, I, I plicated this out with a sort of bicuspidization technique and put a ring on there. And um, unfortunately, the, the picture didn't come out very well, but um, it, it worked very well. And um, that was a successful sort of treatment of what I think is a primary TR, but really is probably from his right ventricle. So thank you for that. Well, and thank you, David. That uh, is fantastic. Um, it's always great to see stuff from the operating room to see what's uh, what's going on. So we'll uh, we'll move along.